Thank you, Jed. It's great to be with all of you here at CAFO. And thanks so much, Andrew, for that beautiful song. I so resonate with those words. Oh God, I am furrowed like the field, torn open like the dirt. And I know that to be healed, that I must be broken first. I am aching for the yield that you will harvest from this hurt. Wow, that's an anthem for my life. And I'm so grateful to you and the whole community of CAFO families for giving me this chance to talk about God's harvest out of my heart. And it blends beautifully with the theme for this conference, how small things matter, little choices can remake your life, how God humbles us, furrows us in our brokenness, forces us to consider tough choices, the little things, the, the small ways we can partner with Christ in remaking our lives, how small matters and little choices can grow a bountiful harvest of righteousness in our character, all to the glory of God. And I'll be the first to say that it is an unpleasant process. 53 years of quadriplegia, battling stage three cancer two times, living daily with uh, chronic pain. Whoa, God has torn me open like the dirt. But in all this, God knew that I must be broken first to be healed. Started decades ago when I first broke my neck from that diving accident. True, I wallowed in self-pity for a long time, but there did come a time when I finally prayed, God, if I'm not gonna die, then you gotta show me how to live. It was a small prayer, but God used it to start doing big things in my life. I would wake up in the morning though, still facing the impossibility of living with hands that don't work and feet that don't walk. How can you smile when you must live with quadriplegia? Well, God specializes in impossibilities. With him, all things are possible. And I was quickly to learn, as uh, C.J. Mahaney once said, that a cross-filled life, we all, we all are called to a cross-filled life, right? It's made up of cross-filled days. Quadriplegia wasn't one big battle. I would win in one day. It's been a thousand little battles that I still need to win throughout a day. Thousands of choices, small drastic obediences, and tough times of trust. Hard earnest decisions to, to pull in, to rein in my self-pity, and utterly cast myself on the Holy Spirit every morning saying, Jesus, I can't do this. I have no smile for this day, but you do, Jesus, so let me borrow your smile. And Jesus has never failed me yet. Every morning, he is ready to throw open the storehouses of heaven to give me grace upon grace to smile, grace to persevere, grace to live life abundantly. But those moments of uh, monumental decision, like uh, do I trust God or not? Do I obey him or do I feel sorry for myself? Do, do, do I believe his promises or am I gonna ignore them? These are, these are small decisions that are hard. And here's an example. I do not sleep well. Really, pain usually wakes me up two or three times a night, and being paralyzed, I cannot move to reposition myself to get comfortable. That is the perfect storm for discouragement. It is Satan's game. It is his trap that he sets at, I don't know, 2 a.m., 4 a.m., in that dark, miserable hour. The adversary thinks that he's got me cornered, got my back against the wall. He thinks I'm easy target to shame the good name of God. Because as far as he is concerned, unyielding pain, no sleep and paralysis, that is an inability to, to move myself or help myself, that's the perfect setup to get Johnny depressed. Let's get Johnny depressed. But in the middle of the night, I have to make that small but significant choice because that pain, that sleeplessness, sleeplessness and paralysis, it can, if I let it, provide the perfect platform for me to, how about pray for others who hurt worse than I do? That, that's a good objective. And that dark hour then becomes a platform for effective and powerful prayer. At 4 a.m., 
Satan hates that I am praying. He despises that I am not focusing inward in panic and self-pity, but my focus is, is Godward, outward. The adversary hates that I pray for people whose disabilities are far, far worse than mine. I pray for people who must drag themselves through the dirt for lack of a wheelchair. How could I possibly complain when, when there are so many who suffer so much more than I do? So I pray for children who suffer. I pray for those suffering under the weight of hopelessness. I pray for them as they receive one of our wheelchairs, a Bible, get connected to a good church. It's like, Johnny, get your eyes off yourself and onto others. And so in the middle of the night, when I'm in bed, awake and in pain, what do you know, Satan's end becomes God's means. His plans, the devil's plans are utterly foiled because my prayers, they've got authority because God knows they're sacrificial. He knows it costs me something to offer up those intercessions. God looks down from on high and as it were says to himself, you know what, th th this lady means business. Like we, we better attend to the prayers that she is offering up and, and animate them and make a, ch that's what God's doing. And so I'm not gonna whine or feel sorry for myself. <laughs> I think that's what gives any petition we put before the Lord preeminent power before God's throne. And if the devil thinks he has me cornered at 4 a.m. in bed and in miserable pain, Satan cannot rub his hands in dark satanic delight for very long, for his evil purposes become God's delight in transforming the world through prayer. What Satan intends for evil, God intends for good. So yes, small matters and little choices have huge, they have global impact. Because get this, did you know that heaven and hell participate in the exact same event, but for different reasons? And don't you wanna be an agent of God's reasons and not Satan's? Again, your small decisions decide how heaven and hell end up participating in the exact same set of circumstances or a situation or an event. I know that sounds strange, but the whole gospel is strange like that. Even angels tremble to gaze at things we yawn at. I mean, think of the gospel that the God of life should destroy the power of evil by letting it destroy him? I mean, that's what the upside down kingdom looks like. The apostle Paul knew this. He's the one who in his own terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse nine. But these things happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. And when you make the small but tough choice to lean on God, as Paul did, You've got the confidence to say with him in 2 Corinthians chapter four, nothing can daunt us. We may be handicapped on all sides, but we're never frustrated. We are puzzled, but never in despair. Persecuted, but we never have to stand it alone. We may be knocked down, but we are never knocked out. Then he says, every day, get that, every day, we experience something of the death of the Lord Jesus so that we might also know the power of the life of Jesus in these bodies of ours. Did you get that? We experience something of death that is something of suffering and pain that we might in turn experience the powerful life of Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said, quote, if the waves roll against you, it only speeds your ship toward the port. You gain by loss. You become strong through weakness. You grow spiritually in sickness. You live by dying, and you are made rich in loss. All things in and of themselves are not good. There is no inherent good in terrible affliction, whether a broken neck or a broken heart or a broken home. But again, what the dark side intends for evil, God intends for our benefit. For there is no circumstance, no trouble, no testing that can ever touch you until first of all, that trouble has gone past God and then pass Christ, and then right through to the one it hurts. And if it has come that far, Alan Redpath said this, it has come with great purpose. You know, that, I love that quote, and I'm constantly sharing it with others, because I believe it. It's the way you live a cross-filled day. I have been trained to comply in tribulation. It is a great grace to be able to welcome a trial and say, uh, again with Spurgeon, 
The Lord must be teaching me some deeper truth that I have not yet learned. He's about to give me some, some closer acquaintance with himself through hardship that I have not yet experienced. He's about to, to, to work some new grace in my heart, which has never been there before. Friend, that's the path to spiritual maturity and Christian character, character that stands the test. True, no one likes to suffer. We hate it. We want out of it. It's never convenient. But, you know, most of the people who suffer say, if you can't get out of it, then I'm going to medicate it. I'm going to escape it. I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to heal it. I'm going to do everything but learn how to benefit from it. <laughs> Yet, suffering should be God's choicest tool in bringing about spiritual maturity and Christian character. But that takes patience. Jesus alluded to this when he said in Matthew chapter 13, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into flour until it worked all through the dough. Like Jesus used a really great word picture there, like something you would see on a, on a, you know, a baking show where they turn a lump of dough into a beautiful loaf of bread. And just as a tiny bit of yeast over time slowly changes the entire character of the dough, so a small step forward slowly over time works its way until your whole character is changed. Like, um, like the fermentation that happens when yeast causes dough to rise. You know it's a slow process. We don't like things to be slow. Oh yeah, we want strong character, but we want to carbonate it. Uh, I think it was Andy Crouch said, inject a little bit of spirituality that gives a buzz, albeit artificial, you know, something fast, something quick, something that looks and feels and has the same fizz as fermentation. But sadly, it's not the real thing. It falls so far short of genuine patience, which over time results in perseverance, which over time, according to Romans chapter five, results in character. So better the yeast of God, better because slow is often the way God works. Frederick Farber says, I love this quote, God is slow, but we're swift. In the same way, grace, for the most part, acts slowly. God and his grace work little by little by little, changing habits, expressing gratitude when your feelings say otherwise, learning to mouth your thankfulness even when your heart feels empty, you know, like mouth it, train your heart, train yourself in godliness and in gratitude, for then heartfelt gladness will rise out of the fermentation of your afflictions. And you'll find yourself sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, having nothing, and yet possessing everything, being poor so that many will be rich. At the bright edge of the garden, at the golden edge of dawn, at the glowing edge of spring, when the winter's edge is gone, and I see the color green, and I can hear the sower's song. Ah. Soon the anointed of the Lord shall obtain joy and gladness, and we all shall enter Zion with singing, with everlasting joy crowning our heads. So, friend, sweat the small stuff where great faith is found. Make hard choices in little things. Make it your ambition to be pleasing to Jesus. Jesus, who keeps sowing a little bit of yeast in your life.